Good morning. Can you hear me? Closer? Better? Okay. Uh, so that was weird, um, but things are blue now. I, I, I didn't know that I wanted to make it Halloween themed and colorful. I'm sorry, I, I messed up. The screen wanted to do it for me. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, Unicode and why strings are kind of weird in Rust um, and using the uh, Han characters as example. So my name is Jenny Manning, uh, and you can find me on Twitter. I'm in Pittsburgh, and that's how I know a lot of people here. Uh, I realized after I made or uh, after I had already chosen this talk that my Twitter handle actually is a uh, ASCII slash Unicode joke. Um, so I was like, oh, that's, that's already thematically correct. Um, so if we just get started with who has tried to index into a string in Rust? Yeah, exactly. And you get a string cannot be indexed error and you're like, why? Why is this happening to me? This is the worst thing ever. Uh, or saying, okay, well, what is the length of these things? What, how long do I expect this string of five letters to be? Cool, it's five, perfect. But what if we start looking at something different? And that is the kanji for Rust, thematic. Uh, <laughs> so if we look at this, then it will say that this single character is three, uh, is three long, not one. And that has to do with the Unicode scalar value of the different lengths of things. Uh, so it, it doesn't always correlate. And so you need to always be saying dot chars and counting them instead of saying dot length. Um, unless you want to actually know the byte length. And these are just what those actual bytes look like in Unicode, it, or in UTF-8, sorry. Um, and if you wanted to try and get the first value of this, it errors out because you're asking for something that's not a valid character on its own. That's what it would be returning if it returned a value is like 233, which is just doesn't make sense. Why is this so complicated? It, most of us just want to use ask or mo oh yeah that looks somewhat normal. Uh, most of us just use Latin-based languages all the time and just want the ease of ASCII. Why does Unicode have so many different characters? Why is it important? Why does Rust actually care about it? And a major reason actually goes way back to the second millennia BCE. Um, in the Shang Dynasty, there was a thing called Oracle Bone Script, which uh, the rulers decided to come up with to divine the future and came up with an entire writing system that if you want to hear more about, we can talk about later outside of this, uh, to capture everything that there is you would want to capture about language. Um, and you write them on a bone and then throw them in a fire and then where it cracks tells you things about the future. But this is what evolved into uh, our classical Chinese. So if we look here, um, this is for like capital, and this is an example. Um, it started in Oracle Bone Structure, Bone Script, uh, and then evolved and changed over time. Um, and a major thing about this is also the fact that when this happened, the traditional Chinese at that step um, also spread to Korea, Vietnam, and Japan around that same time period. So we have all of the very similar symbols across all of these different cultures and languages. So the traditional one is uh, what things usually look like in Korean, and now it's mostly just Hangul that's used, and not Hanja, but it's a old-fashioned way of doing it. Um, and then modern Chinese has simplified it a little bit. But these are the same, they have different pronunciations in all the different languages, but the same meaning. Okay, so that's nice and all, but still, why can I not use just use ASCII? Well, ASCII's kind of old. Like, it was developed to, for telephone codes. Uh, it was published in the 60s, uh, and the first thing it was used for was a teleprinter code, which, a teleprinter code? That's interesting. But, so at least after that, uh, here, let me make this a little bit bigger, because it's difficult to see. Sorry, 
Uh, so that's why at least Unicode was thought of. Uh, some people at Xerox and Apple decided to start trying to come up with an idea for a universal character set. Um, so they started collaborating on that. And there's also a, there's some other details of that. But it was started in the 80s, in the late 80s, and then was published in the, er the first version was published in the early 90s. And the entire point of it was to have a unique co code point for each character. Um, and for the second volume that they published eight months later, this included the Han unification, which is related to what I was saying a second ago and was very controversial um, for reasons. <laughs> uh, oh. oh, so I said it is a character, right? So, but what is actually a character? Um, so there are, there's a grapheme and a glyph so a grapheme is actually what we think of as like the letter A, number zero. It's an abstract, uh, the smallest abstract unit for a writing system. But a glyph is what we see. It's the different fonts, how they look in every different font. Uh, and it's a specific shape that represents that. And that was a major point of Unicode. Unicode encodes the graphemes, not the Glyphs. Okay. There we go. So when ASCII was created, it decided to unify some overlapping GIFs that it saw. Like the apostrophe and the single quotation mark are just the same. Like they're not unique characters at all. Um, but when Unicode was created, it was focusing a lot more on the graphemes over the GIFs. Glyphs. Uh, because it wanted to try and have a lot more characters in it. So this leads into what I mentioned before of the Han unification. So if we look at those characters that are in Chinese, Korean, Japanese, some used in Vietnam, uh, that's a lot of characters. And some of them have very small alterations, some of them have huge alterations. It very much varies. Um, but when they were adding or releasing the second edition, the second volume, they were only they were said you can have 2,000 code points to get all of Asian languages in here and everything you need. So there had to be some creative thinking. So the concept of abstract character shape and actual character shape were defined, and they're sort of graphemes and glyphs, and they mapped multiple character sets into one code point. Um, for across Chinese, Korean, and Japanese. Um, and they were not unified necessarily by their appearance, but by their meaning or definition. There are cases where you have the same character in Chinese and Japanese, and it means something completely different. Those were given unique code points. So if we go back to this one that we were talking about, all of these across Chinese, Japanese, and Korean all have, this has one code point, and it has a font on top of it. So like Times New Romans is how we change the appearance of A, that's how a language, like that's how an entire culture is set. Um, it can also be like a locale and things of that sort. But it's, so it ends up with some weird things happening and is a major reason why it's controversial. Um, but for this case, they're all the same meaning and generally about the same, so it's just a little, might be a little different looking, but they generally look the same. But there are also some ones where they look really, really different. Um, so Korean uses the traditional one. Um, a lot of modern Chinese uses the simplified one. And then Japanese has a totally different thing altogether. So all of these, across these three different cultures, this is a case where they are really, really different um, and can be very confusing. For this specific case, those did end up being broken up into late outside code points later because they're so different, but there are other cases where the shapes can be different across one language and they still have the same code point. So some different consequences of this is the fact that it's really difficult to render these in the same file. Um, so it's difficult to have, uh, like, to render all, it, it's hard to find examples even on the internet because it's hard to have them on the same page. 
Uh, you have to actually like take screenshots and such. It's uh, interesting. But uh, they're all the same Unicode value. Um, so it's very confusing for people who want to talk about potentially the historical aspect of this is the traditional symbol that led into this because it's the same symbol and you're setting your font on that and then you have, it. it's just very difficult. Um, and then showing, you can end up with the wrong variants very easily. Um, and that can also mean if you copy and paste something and you have the wrong font set, then you might see the completely wrong thing. Um, and this is a big reason why people were unhappy and felt that their culture and the differences between all of those different cultures were being kind of ignored and uh, blended together. The distinctions were didn't exist anymore. So it was able to change it from two or a hundred thousand characters and condense it into only twenty thousand characters for the first edition. Uh, which is very useful because then future editions of more uh, say G C G K characters were added and more allotments were added in the future. But it's very easy to end up with the wrong thing and you might end up with like kind of wonky looking things. Huh. Uh, so in Unicode, there is a million different spots that are actually like available currently in Unicode that we allow for. Um, and as of right now, 137,000 of these are actually assigned. 70,000 of those are for, uh, and that's Chinese, Japanese, Korean, uh, CGK, uh, unified characters. When they first said you only can have so many slots, they weren't planning to expand that much. This is what the Unicode code space looks like. Yeah, all of that white is unset. <laughs> so they uh, condensed everything down and said you can only have so many spots, but this also shows how much Unicode is going to expand um, and how many more code points we're gonna end up with. Um, pretty much only the first two planes are used. Uh, blue refers to them being used, um, and white is unused. Uh, and there are 17 planes across this, and there's a lot of code points in each one. So if we actually just look a little bit into each of these, the ones that are actually used. So when they were first coming out with Unicode, this is the only plane they planned to use at all. They weren't really planning on going past this, or you know, very much past it. They weren't planning on expanding that much. So the first plane has most of the commonly used characters. Can you see, can you guys read that actually? Yeah, okay. Uh, so the all of the sage, CGK characters were given, those first 20,000 slots they were given are all of the yellow, or er, pink here. So before that, for the first edition of Unicode, it only had up to 33. Um, and then all of those things were added later. So we keep adding more and more things to this. And this is the uh, BMP, it's the first one. So then we've added more uh, historical and sim uh, symbols and notations. Uh, the supplementary multilingual plane uh, is the next one, and it has l like Egyptian hieroglyphics and less common things in it. Um, but we're still we can still expect to see these things. And then the second plane, which is the third plane, because indexing off of zero. <laughs> uh, this contains all of the additional or uh, a it condition, contains a lot of additional characters. Um, when Unicode was first created, the second volume was added, there was, most family names weren't able to be written on the internet. Um, all of the different characters we talked about are like last names and make up people's names. So, and a lot of times still people cannot, there are still many people who cannot have their name actually, it does not exist in Unicode. Like there's just not a value for it. Um, so they added a lot of names to the second plane to try and offset that, but it's, a it's another criticism of the Han unification, that they only went for commonly used words and that didn't support a lot of other aspects. <sighs> okay, so this is what, just from a coloring perspective, if we wanna see 
what that looks like just overall, but uh, the Han unification ends up being, is all the teal. So that is still a large amount of what is said. And this is, oh, off of this, this is the usage. So this is how often these different things are used. So even though the third plane exists for family names, it's almost never used. So we kind of do care the most about ASCII. Like we do care the most about our Latin characters. Uh, and it's, this is how often each code point actually exists in the uh, real world. Um, and this is off of a sample of, the sampling comes from Wikipedia and Twitter. That's where the usage on the internet comes from. Uh, so Unicode started with being able to be, they, there were a few different encodings that were tried, but the ones that ended up sticking were UTF-8, 16, and 32. Um, and UTF-8 was actually invented at a, on a, di at a diner by Ken Thompson and Rob Pike uh, on like a napkin at like in September of like 1992. They were like, there's not a good way to solve this. And they were like, wait, I have an idea and literally wrote it down on a napkin in a diner and then, yeah. So that's, a, that's an interesting thing about it. Uh, but the way that or UTF-8 works actually is we have a limit that you can have four bytes. It was set in 2003 uh, that that is the most space UTF-8 characters can take up so that you can only expand so much. Um, and for the most part, the one byte is ASCII characters, two is things with uh, accents and more Greek characters, and then the third is a lot of things in the Han unification. Um, and fourth is mostly uh, used for like emojis and such right now. <laughs> uh, but the way that it works is you don't actually end up with all four bytes. You actually only end up with 21 unique spots um, for like the third, fourth one, because to tell it to even look forward to the next byte, uh, there's, it's either ten, one zero or, I mean, you can see. <laughs> but uh, that is how, when looking forward, it knows whether it's, what a char is. That's how it's easily able to look forward when parsing out. And UTF-16 has a similar thing, but it's only two versus, uh, four bytes, so. Um, but a thing that is unusual about UTF-16 is that it has some surrogates. Um, so that allows more pairings and is kind of was tacked on as an afterthought. But Rust uses UTF-8, so that's not. Um, and Rust has chosen to, by default, uh, enforce that all characters are UTF-8. And this is why we care about any of these things, because Rust says, if it's not valid to parse UTF-8, then I'm not gonna even let you compile this. Um, so it's saying, instead of letting people shoot themselves in the foot, like you can in C or Java or other languages that will let you index into a string and have a seg fault or a runtime error or panic, uh, Rust tries its best to not let you do that um, and tries to make it so that you have to think about UTF-8 problems up front and actually think about how to, why, why do we care about this? Um, yeah. So in Rust, how do I get character actus of a string? We're so used to this. You, you just can't. It's, Rust doesn't allow it. You have to, you have to change it to something else. Um, so some different best practices for Rust is uh, that spr string slicing is dangerous because that is not a thing that is protected. You, can index, you can't index and say, give me the first byte or the second byte, but you can say, give me the first four bytes. Um, and if you don't have that end on a valid code point, then it will panic. So you can, you can slice into your string um, and then cause Rust to panic. So it's much better to iterate all over it using chars, um, and this doesn't. But this doesn't handle the actual grapheme clusters. Um, you need to use a different crate for that. Um, and you should also do normalize your strings before doing comparisons, uh, because the character for e with an accent can also be combined by having e and then a like combining character and then an accent. 
and those aren't actual valid, those aren't the same. If you try and compare those strings, Rust or most programming, language, programming languages will not tell you that they are the same. They will say these are different, uh, so, it, but if you normalize them, then it will combine them into the same thing and it will combine the diatribe. Uh, and there is a crate that I recommend for that. Uh, and I'm actually going to end here, if that is cool with people. Um, thank you a lot for listening. Um, I hope there was something useful. <laughs>